the message tonight is just as important as any night. Are you with me? Just as important as any night. And the Holy Spirit is present to guide. <coughs> Sex is such a touchy subject that every time I do this presentation, I have to be reminded to let people know that God is, God is a forgiving God. Amen? Amen. God is a, a God of restoration. And many of us would have made mistakes. I would have told you of, of some of the mistakes that I have made. Many, many of them. And in coming to Jesus, I found him to be most gracious, forgiving, restorative in his approach, redemptive. So that for those of us who would have made mistakes, the thing that I would say is not to, to condemn you or to, to make you feel terrible. But I want to let you know that Jesus is able to forgive and to restore. And if you would put your hand in his hand tonight, you would put your heart, you would trust your life with him, he would do just that for all of us. Are we together? Yes. I want us to go to 1 Corinthians. But I want to read off the screen because I have found this in the Message Bible. So the language is a lot simpler. Are we together? A lot simpler. So let's have a word of prayer, let's bow our heads, and then we will begin to read. Heavenly Father, we thank you for joining us to this place tonight. We know that the Holy Spirit is here to guide and lead us into truth and to give us power so that we will be doers of your word, livers of the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right? So you are reading with me from the screen. All right? Can we read together after 4, 3, 4? You know the old saying, first you, and then you. Mm -hmm. Well, it may be true that the body is only a temporary thing, but that's no excuse for stuffing your body with, or, mm -hmm. since the master honors you with a body, honor him, honor him with, with your body. Since the master honors you with a body, honor him with yours. And that is something that we have to understand. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your body is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. It is a gift from God. And God treats you, treats you with honor by giving you that body. So that we are to return the favor and honor him with the body that he has given. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Let's go. God. Mm -hmm. So just as, just as the father raised the son from the grave, they are saying he will treat your body with the same resurrection power. Let's go again. Until... Until that time, remember that your bodies are created with the same dignity. You got that? And I, I underline that term, the same dignity as the master's body. Master, same dignity as the master's body. You wouldn't take the master's body off to a whole house, would you? I should hope not. There's more to... There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two what? The two become one. Since we want to become spiritually one with whom? With the master. Do we want to become spiritually one with the master? We must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids what? Commitment and intimacy. Leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. There is a sense in which sexual sins are different from, from all others. In sexual sin, 
we violate the sacredness of what? Of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with another. So you understand why the bodies were given? You understand? They are, your bodies are to honor God and your bodies are given for becoming one with another in the context of God-given and God-modeled love. Are you with me? That is the reason for, for, for the giving of the bodies. One of the big words you are going to see tonight, and you have to understand, that sex was given is God's idea. He invented it. Are you with me? It's a wonderful thing. You don't have to look so sad. Why are we looking so sad and so frightened? Like we're afraid of what the pastor is going to say. The thing about it is, God has given us sexual activity in a context. And the context of sexual activity is covenant love. You with me? Remember we talked about covenant love some time ago? When we talk about the possibility of going to the place where you and your mate are in a relationship and you are willing to die for one another. So the idea is that we need to understand, and I'm saying this up front, because if, that is, if I have to say the thesis of this thing, this would be it. And you have to understand that if you are not prepared to share life, life, because remember we talked about the two things that we say, uh, the, the differences between contract and covenant. Contract says as long as we both shall love. Eh? As long as we both shall love. That is what covenant, what our contract says. As long as we both shall love, we'll be together. The day the love change, forget it, pack up, leave. You with me? Right, I don't, I, don't, just, I just don't feel that way anymore. That is what people are saying these days. Covenant says as long as we both shall live. You with me? That doesn't mean that you have to poison your mate to get out of the covenant. You with me? If, 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 if you do that, you're still in trouble. You're still in trouble. You understand what I'm saying? Pastor said, I can't get out. I'll kill this man. That is not what we're saying at all. So this passage of scripture give us a little insight. Let us go a little further. The sex act. What happens, and we are talking about process. The act of sex or the experience, I, I don't like the word act. I, I promised to change it, but I forgot to change it. The experience of sex can only make sense if the intent and purpose of sex is known. You got that? Yeah. You have, before you, before you can engage in it meaningfully, you have to find out why God invented it. What did he have in mind? What was supposed to happen? Who was it supposed to be for? You with me? Because, you know, it would be, it would be a sad thing if we come now and find out it wasn't for males at all. That would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? So we have to find out, you know, up front. Who is it for? Why did God give it? What, what, what are the objectives of sexual activity? All of these things. Usually people don't think about all of these things. Boy meets girl, they start to breathe heavy. Next thing you know, they close off and they go on in the act. They didn't study none of these things. What is this for? How will it affect me later? Pastor, am I right? Pastor, I'll be picking on you a lot this evening. Be prepared for that. Let's go, let's go to Genesis 1.28. Somebody on the well, somebody on my left could find that Genesis 1.28, and somebody on the right could find Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Let's do some reading. Mm hmm On the earth. So the first we see, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and do what? That is the first command in scripture. The first command that I want to know, I want you to know that it is not a suggestion that God made. It is a command. Be fruitful and multiply. That is after God would have, have created them in his own image and that kind of thing. Are we together still? So one of the early signs that we see of, of the purposes of sexual activity is for the purpose of, of multiplication. But I wanted to note, note the word before multiplication is fruitful. Fruitful. 
So what the Bible is saying, you have to be fruitful, meaning you have to produce fruit. Let me tell you about that fruit. When you talk about fruit, because watch this, eh? what the Bible is actually alluding to is that it's the same thing I talked about in the garden with Adam and Eve. Remember, Adam is the one who is made with the equipment to sow and pass on seed. And I told you that it is the position of the man in God's intention that the man receives from God and passes on to his wife and family. Are you with me? So what Adam is supposed to do is have this relationship with God so that inside of Adam is sown because he's taking the word of God. Eh? God is speaking to him and God is creating within him the seed of the woman. So when he passes on his seed, when he passes on his seed, he is passing on seed of the woman. You with me? So the woman is receiving that seed, and the both of them are supposed to bring forth fruit or bring forth children, or even before children, in their own lives, they are supposed to be manifesting the fruit of the seed. Are you with me? The fruit of the seed is, is, is like what they're saying, the fruit of the spirit. They are bringing forth godliness in their lives. Fruitful. So when the Bible says, when the Bible says that if you abide in me, that is John 15, you will bring forth much fruit. What Jesus is talking about, fruit in the Hebrew, is what you do with your hands and say with your mouth. Are you with me? So when that seed is in you, your hands will do godly things. Remember, I've said that night after night, and your mouth will speak godly things. Are you with me? That is fruit bearing. So fruit bearing and passing on that seed so that others like Adam will come and bring forth the same fruit that he has produced. You with me? That is how God's glory would spread in the world. So what is supposed to be happening now is that all of us as men are, so, are seed sowers. I told you in Hebrew, form has to do with function. Are you with me? And we are all seed sowers. But we are supposed to be receiving seed. From the Father, engulfed in the word of God, saturated with the Holy Spirit, that is creating this seed in us and bringing forth fruit. Fruit that is pleasing to God. We are living a life that is pleasing to God. When we pass on that to our wives and, 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 and we come together and we bring forth children, our children are supposed to behave like us, who are supposed to be behaving like Jesus. You with me? So you have a set of little Jesus children running around the place. Am I right? Not, not them, some of them little devils that we see. Right? Jesus' children running all about the place doing nice and kind things. And when they go and they come up and, you know, especially the sons come up and they come up with the females and they come together, they produce more children. Are you with me? And that is how the legacy of God is continuing and the glory of God is spreading out through the world. Let me just take a little aside. To make that happen and to, to facilitate that reality, we are given three things. The home, the church, and the school are all supposed to work together as a tag team to make sure the children stay on a godly path. What has happened? The home has broken down. I'm taking a little aside. Pastor, is all right? The homes have broken down, haven't they? No worship, no God in the homes at all. That is what is happening. I'm talking about church people. You with me? No worship, no God, no good relationship. The husband and the wife are supposed to be working at tag team. And they are so in tandem with one another that when the children look at them at an early age, the first Jesus they see is mommy and daddy. And that is supposed to add something on their mind forever. So when that is done in the home and you send them to school, because the school is church school, and it has the same philosophy as the home, the church, the school could continue that work that the parents did. And then now you send them to the church that has the same philosophy as the home and the school. Are you with me still? And so your children are hooked are boxed in by a three-way assault of the Holy Spirit on them all the time. Because what you want to happen in producing these children is expanding the kingdom. Are you with me? You're expanding the kingdom. So you're bringing more citizens of the kingdom. So you're bringing people who are so bombarded with godliness and that kind of thing that it is embedded in them. 
So when your young boys go and you, they are differentiated, meaning you are supposed to work yourself out of a job. Mm. There is supposed to come a time when those girls in your house are supposed to leave your house. And if they refuse to leave, kick them to the curb. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, you, you like that, you like that. You want, me, you want me to throw stones for you. That's what you want me to do, you know? You hear you preach it, you didn't say that whole week. Whole week, sis, I hear preaching all kind of things, you sit on quiet. Mm, mm, now you're balling out. I ain't doing no dirty work for your pastor. Talk, talk to your people for themselves. But seriously, you parenting, that's what parenting is. Parenting is working yourself out of a job so you don't have to work later down the road. Right? You can't have a child in your house 40 years. Huh? 40 years. You want to go nowhere. When he's giving you a dress, talking about you, I don't wish me to mommy. You mad? 40? He, no, serious. I serious about this one. He has to be kicked. Listen, I tell my daughter, play. I say, you're, going, you're 13 now, going on 14. You have four years in my house again. <laughs> four years. I say, when it's 18, leave. I need time with my wife. You understand? No, I tell her that. <laughs> I tell her that. When I used to tell her that earlier, she used to cry. Now she don't cry. She's just troops and shakes she head. She don't bother. She don't bother with me. I had to go and say, child, I see you. Yes, you know. But I'm, I'm instilling in her mind from now, while I'm working, we are working towards it, that there's a time that you have to leave. And that is why the Bible says, therefore shall a man, ah, the responsibility is on the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Note, not mother and father, you know, his father and his mother, because his father's house is not mother's house. Say amen. amen. Man, come on, say amen. I'm giving us pips. So, if you're still in your mother's house, you ain't no man. You manish. You manish. A man leaves his mother and father, cleaves to his wife, and he starts his new cycle. And that is what is supposed to be continuing. You with me? And that, in a nutshell, is, is what this sex thing is about. One of the aspects of it is to produce godly children. Procreation. But the procreation is not just having children while it is a structured and a planned thing where we are putting out citizens of the kingdom. And we, are, we have them enrolled in a plan, in a scheme that is meant to reinforce all the things. So it's triple reinforcement. Watch it. Just as you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's the same way you have the same three, threesome working on your children. The home, the church, and the school. So some of us, what happens in Trinidad, I don't know what happens all about. You have what you call prestige schools. The schools that do better, the schools that have the big fun and the big money. Eh? Because we want the children to be bright, not godly or holy. Bright. We send them to those schools. Not thinking that they are sowing into them the seed of the other side. Because once they don't have within the system seed of the woman and that philosophy, Jesus said, if you're not sowing with me, you're scattering abroad. So you really making children, you really educating and guiding your children to populate hell. And to advance the devil's kingdom. Because when they come out, they don't want to hear nothing about church. They don't want to hear nothing about God. They don't want to go and share no literature. They don't want to preach no sermon. They want to sing no song. So they are not sowing into the Father's kingdom. But the bright, like satellite, you know, it is, that is what happened with Esau. Remember, I tell you about Esau? Esau bringing home wild meat for his father. His father loves it. But he's not bringing home anything from the church. Not bringing home anything from the church. He ain't bringing home no songs. He didn't come in and say, Mommy, they asked me to do this display and I want you to help me. They asked me to act as Joseph. When we do that with our young kids, we reinforce in their minds the seed of the woman, the godly things. When we do those stories over and over and over and over, they come to understand that running away from illicit sexual activity, God claps that. And that is something that pleases God. And they will come naturally with the instinct to want to please God. But we're churning out children who care two hoots. And we're sending them to all these different kinds of schools. 
Plus, the homes have broken down. The fathers have absconded their roles. The fathers have given up their roles. Let me tell you something. Eve was manipulated because Adam somehow strayed. So that is why you will hear the Bible say, Eve was deceived, but Adam transgressed. So when God came looking for them, watch it. God came looking for them in the garden. I'm, I'm a little I'm a bit aside now, right? But we'll come back to the sex now a bit. God comes looking for them in the garden. I told you this already. He asked Adam, where are you? Because you were supposed to take a certain position. You were supposed to be at the head. You were supposed to be in a certain place defending your wife. Where are you? I put you to be head. Where are you? And you have to ask every man in this room that. Where are you tonight? In light of what God has called you to. Some of us don't care about the image of God being restored in us. But we want to rule houses. I is the boss. When I talk, not a dog. When, I, when juice is made in the house, I have to drink juice first. Not a man must eat out of that pot unless I eat. Foolishness. That is the things of the world. What the Bible says, when men lead, they lead by precept and example. The first thing a man is supposed to be willing to do is to lay down his life. And if you don't have that spirit operating in you, where you're willing to lay down your life, you shouldn't want to rule nothing. Are we together? The role of the man is seriously critical. The role of the woman it's just as critical. I told you and I showed you that when God gave man a help meet, it come like God put himself in female form and said, look man, this is what you will need to fulfill your purpose. So a man cannot come out of his place without the woman. Is either she stand aside and did nothing or she helped him come out of the place. So all this talk about man going out of the place, women have to, take, have to take some responsibility too because you don't even understand what your role is as help me. Are, we, are, you, are you with me? We don't. And that is something I, I told you. I told the people in my conference, I wanted to be the women's ministry's leader at the conference. I told them, I told them that. I, the president sat on the Russian view. I was introducing him. My intern was having a crusade on the day. And the woman ministry leader. And I said, we have two people here. The president and the woman ministry leader. If I have to covet an office, I want to be women's ministry leader. Because I believe there's a message that women need to get. And when they get it, it will, they'll be a force. Not all this woman's lip stupidness. But it's we time now. Your time for what? For what? No, well, answer me not. For what? You understand? You won't even know why God make you. You're talking about it's your time now. If you don't know what is your purpose, you don't need any time. You don't. What we're supposed to be doing, sister, sister us, is coming back to find out what would God have us do. And when we come back and find out what would God have us do, and we give ourselves to that, then we fit into what Ellen White said. Ellen White said plenty of us, the women she was talking about. Read it. I didn't write it. She put it. When, when, the, when the Bible says that the woman saw that the, 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 the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and wanted to make men wild, she ate and gave her husband. Ellen White comments and said, many women in this world are dissatisfied with the position God would have them. They feel that God didn't give them enough, so they have to strive for something better. Now, I'm not saying that women are not supposed to strive for something better, but you have to make sure that whatever you're striving for is what God is striving to give you. So Paul says, I realize God has some things for me, and he's running me down to give it to me. I am running into God to get the things that he has for me. Are you with me? And because the society is out of whack, and we're learning from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's what we're learning from. That's why we have all of these segregated things. That's why we have these fights about man and woman fighting. Imagine, look how foolish it is. God made them different. With their differences inherent. And God says, when you come before me, I will make you function as one. The differences are needed. 
for God's power to be manifested. But we cussing one another because we're different. God make we so. I tell people, if I am meant, if God meant me to be a radio, don't expect me to show no pictures. <laughs> I don't want to show no pictures. You can tell me how wonderful pictures are, how much you want. God made me to be a radio. And the last time I looked, radio don't show pictures. Don't come and tell me how to get in touch with my picture side. What picture side? I didn't see that in the Bible. We have come up with all kinds of things. But we are learning from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not see that the woman instructing us at all. So if you ain't following, see that the woman. If you ain't following the Bible, we get wisdom from to instruct me as to how I be. Fast! Am I talking the truth? So I want to show you this. Sex has a reason. Sex has a purpose. All that I said there. Encapsulate what we're talking about with sex. Then the Bible says in, in chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, I want to read that again. 24 and 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Three steps. Leave. Leave. That's the next thing. We need to finish tonight. You know. I'm trying to study. I'm studying this. I'm studying this. How I'm going to finish this presentation. It says, plenty of we in leave. I've gone out from a mother and father's house, but every Monday are there. In <laughs> giving no time. You, 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 you have your mother and father up in your business. Listen, something I just say when I'm marrying people. I'll just tell the couple. This Baba Ide. So I start with the man. I said, turn around, look for all them women and them you used to be with. Look for your mother, your father, and all them people you have strong connection with, and Baba. Tell them Baba. Tell the woman the same thing. And then after that, I say, as of today, all in laws become outlaws. <laughs> and I make that announcement. It finish. No, seriously. That is what Jesus means. That is what the Bible means. You have to not abandon your mother and father and they start with mother and father because that is the most basic relationships, right? Some of us are really hooked up here. You have to leave them. You have to leave. You have to cut off the influence sometimes. You have to listen. When you're getting married, you can't lie with the boys like you used to. That is a fact. When you're getting married, you can't hang with the girls like you used to. You have to give your relationship time. That is why in Israel, what they used to do was give you a year off from the army. So that a man who now married should have no office in the church. Oh, look quiet about that one. Shouldn't give him no office. Give him on time. Let him go home and hug up his wife. If he wants to stay home on his Sabbath day and do that kind of thing, you have to give him time. The thing needs time. So you have to leave and you have to cleave. So you have to, you have to it comes as though you have to isolate yourself. So you get a bond. Sex is part of that bonding. Are you with me? To bring you to oneness where God is going to see you as one unit now. Even though you have two individuals, one unit. And that is what sex does and it's supposed to do. That is why I jump in ahead of myself. That is why when you involve yourself in sexual activity, it's hard to put away. God made it so. But you see, if you follow and you do it as God said to do it, you will have already discussed the issues. You didn't want to pull away. We already decided that we join in lives. And, and it's because we have joined lives, now we are joining bodies together. Are we together? So that is the context, the marital situation. I will show you a few passages in a little while. It should only convene if the intent is desired. So sex is something that we talk about. We think about. Do you know there are people, there are people who get married where sex is not in the equation? I know people who have been married like that and they had to dissolve the wedding, the marriage. Honeymoon night? Man, I'm saying me and cater for that. The first time I hear that pastor, I said, well, what do you used to talk about? Huh? Ross, will you? How? 
how sex could take you by surprise honeymoon night? Who all they used to talk about Ruth? Huh? Cricket? <laughs> Star Trek? <laughs> That's what you're talking about. And you ain't discussing the thing. You know, because, you know, it's natural. It's natural. Brother Moses, it's natural. You and the wife courting, the wife to be courting, that kind of thing. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Angels fighting to keep all apart because naturally you want to come together. Am I talking in truth? Oh, your face gets serious all of a sudden. <laughs> Hypocrites. <laughs> they know fully well what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, they get righteous and serious. <laughs> no. One set of hypocrites in this place sitting. <laughs> it should only convene if it is desired. So you have to talk about it. You have to talk. You see, just like we're talking about the issues, you have to learn, young people. What sex is for? What God say? And when you sit down with the intended, you have to talk about that. How are we going to come together and use these two sacred temples to advance the kingdom of God? How are we going to? No, it is, you have to talk because sometimes in growing up, people have issues, physical issues, that will prevent them from being intimate. You have to talk about that. You can't wait till you start. You have to talk about those things up front so we know from in front what challenges we are going to have huh what are you saying i didn't hear yeah 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 you know since we, we didn't use the premarital thing yet but you know i laying the foundation i laying the foundation so just like what's his name isaac knew he had to pray for rebecca when you when you understand and, you know, in a real way, when you understand what is happening to one another, you can make a decision if you're going ahead to get married or not. Mrs. White say, if you reach up on the altar and change your mind, bro, or lady, go, you know. Don't feel no how we go eat the food, pastor. We'll go by the reception hall, we go eat the food and that kind of thing, but it's better to break it at the altar than after you say, I do begin to talk about what? Are you with me? So, that is those are you think it has to it should convene only if the intent is desired and sex is a part of a bigger picture called covenant right we'll talk about that some more right i'm ready for a couple now the garys are going to help me do an illustration come 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 you think i forget see your wife say long day fingers crossed <laughs> sure she toes crossed in them shoes too <laughs> trying to get out it's not no getting out Hold hands, join hands. You could move together, you're married. Right. Move together, move together. Don't watch me. <laughs> just no, wait. wait. Don't hug up here. Don't hug up here. I just wanted to face one another. Go a little closer. A little closer. All right, watch one another. Don't watch me. This is what you call anatomical juxtaposition. It's a big word. That just means bodily lineup. You with me? No. Bodies have to line up. What are you talking about? Okay. Keep focus here. Keep focus here. No plans for later. <laughs> right. Bodies line up. For sex to take place, bodies have to line up. Am I talking the truth? And there is a reason, even though that one is taller than the other, basically the similar parts are facing each other. Right? So head facing head, she will enjoy in this one. <laughs> head facing head, chest areas are coming together, pelvic areas are together. You with me? You with me? <laughs> Control that lady. <laughs> You're going on. <home> <laughs> this thing getting excited. The alignment with intent. Whenever bodies come together like that, it says we have intentions. So that's why you can't go to a dance or a party or something and be grooving and grinding with somebody. Nah. You want your body's line up, say you're saying you have intentions because that is what it is for. So it is not like an innocent dance with bodies line up. That's not innocent. That's not innocent. 
Because the natural laws of nature are going to take place. From the time a man, a man is there and a breast brush against his chest, he starts thinking it's an automatic switch. I don't care how he ordained if he's pastor, bishop, pope. That is how he is. Breast touch him, mind gone. You understand? And with a man, he reached quite down the road. And you ain't even start yet. That is how it is. So the lineup, the lineup is for Pastor Howard Talk. Good. The lineup shows the intention where the exchanges are going to take place. Ready what? Exchanges. When we line up like that, it symbolizes points of exchange and agreement. I'll talk about that just now. It says the purpose is understood and agreed upon. It says we have thought this out. We know what the effects are going to be. And we agree to do it in the name of God and we're going to do it. That's what we say. This don't happen by mistake. You don't just walk down the road and trip and end up lined up with a woman like that. That don't happen. That don't happen. You have to think and plan it. Are you with me? Let me talk about exchanges now. Well, you enjoying this, boy. I see that. Help me out here, see. Thanks. I'm a good partner in partner in crime. I'll miss him. I'll miss I'll miss the I'll miss YouTube. I'll miss I'll miss CC, my boy. You know? He encouraging me in slackness. I'm <laughs> watching cricket. Things I don't do. I listen, I hate cricket. Hate it. <laughs> when I tell you hate cricket. Hate cricket. Everybody is telling me that you ain't no West Indian. I tell them I can't take the white pants. Well, they don't do have white pants. You know they used to be white pants before? You wouldn't caught, you wouldn't catch me dead in a white pants. And whole day chucking her back, chucking her back. <laughs> I can't take that. But now they make the 2020 thing it exciting. So see and, and Patrick I'm bawling and screaming yesterday in the people's house. Like a madman. When I done I check myself, I say, boy, you backsliding bro. <laughs> these, these, these people, these people not good, these church people not good for you. You wouldn't used to do these kind of things. They're talking about the exchanges. Sisters, Ruth, make sure and take up a collection by the door for this comedy festival that these people get in, right? Take a collection. Watch it. Exchanges. When the bodies line up and you engage in sexual activity, there are going to be exchanges. People perspire when having sex. So when your perspiration goes on him, watch this. When your perspiration goes on him and his go on you, the pores and the skin take it in. Huh? So these exchange of fluids, watch. So it talks about DNA, alters in many dimensions, sweat and other bodily fluids, semen from the man, exchanging with vaginal secretions from the woman. The exchange. You with me? And in all of these things, you know the song that says, every time you go away, you take a piece of me with you? Mm, that's what is happening. So some of you are going into him. And some of him are going into you. That is why after a while of having sex, people start to resemble. You know that? No, seriously, some people in relationships, they start to look like one another. And if they don't start to look like one another, Andre, they start to behave, adopt the language and all that kind of thing of the mate. Your DNA is being affected. Now watch this. I want to do some illustrations. Let me get three people from here. Let me get four from here. Quick. On this side. Three and four. Come quick. Good boy. Let's come on this side. Come on this side. Four on this side. Three over there. I need a man here. Make it four. I need a man. No, sit, stand up. Make it four. I need a man. Come quick. Come quick. Come quick. Lord, fella, looking back. <laughs> Come more in the middle. Right, you go over and that side. I want you to stand right behind the woman. Right behind the woman. And I want you to stand right behind the man. You my next man. Come, Patrick. <laughs> I ain't, ain't wasting time. Come, brother Moses. Watch 
watch this. We're talking about the exchange. These two people are in a marriage and they are having sexual activity. I told you before they are exchanging. They're exchanging several things. On the emotional level, they are, they are exchanging affection and trust. Trust because to go naked in front of somebody, I had to trust that person. If you have issues, if you have issues, lights in coming off. All the lights had to come off. Light cast the one at all. You know, there are some people like that. They must have sex in absolute darkness. They will not undress in front of their mate. I'm serious. And they're married for a long time. Issues. That needs to be fixed. Because the undressing clothes is our defense as well as our identity. You know that. It is our defense. We get naked in front of people whom we trust. Am I talking the truth? And once you trust people, you strip that kind of thing. Right? When we have issues, we are afraid to take off. We have to take off all the lights so that the person doesn't see. That kind of thing. So they are exchanging trust when they get naked. Let me talk about that after. Let me tell you what happens. We're talking about DNA, exchanging fluids. If he goes and he takes a woman and he has sex with her, talking about adultery. No. You with me? He has sex with somebody who is beside his wife. Not only does he have his wife's DNA in him, he gets DNA from this woman. You with me? Chances are, when he goes back and has sex with his wife, some of her get into her. Are you with me still? Yes, that happens. And that happens with diseases because if, if she has a disease, he could carry it home to his wife and we know about cases where that has happened. Are you with me? But he's also carrying DNA. So watch this. Sometimes I've heard this, and, and this, is, this is actually recorded fact. She has a menstrual cycle. Let's say she begins on the 25th of the month. And she is the 30th, religiously. When he sleeps with both of them, all of a sudden their cycles are messed up. They might try to take one another's. You understand what I'm saying? Or... They just throw them off completely and they become erratic. These are things that happen with extramarital affairs. This person interferes with this person. But she may not have been only with him. She may have been with him. And he may have been with these two. Are you with me? Wait. He would have been with these two. And a reality in today's world, she may have been with her. <laughs> no, I, listen, I dead serious. This, this might seem funny. This might seem funny, but this ain't funny. This ain't funny. So when, when he now goes with her, all of them come in him. And he going off load on the poor wife. She now have her side of her business going on. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, Pastor? So all of these people come together in a bunch. Come, come around them in a bunch. Because of these who come together, come closer. All of them are having sex with each other. You see how nasty that thing is? Huh? You see the, poten the potential for danger? That we don't even know what are some of the things that we do in young people. I wanted to see this, you know. Because this is not only married people. It's worse among the unmarried. Are you with me? Because if they're not married, put your hands up. They're just having wild sex with people. And every time you have sex with somebody, you have sex with all the people that person has sex with. And each of them pieces are coming into you. That is why... People who are involved in premarital sex and extramarital sex, the moods change because it's not just you. It's all kind of people tangling up in you. Watch what is worse. Whenever there's sexual activity and both parties reaching orgasm at the same time, when that happens, the ultimate exchange takes place. You exchange spirits now. Are you with me? Because 
when you're having an orgasm, when you reach a point of time that you are most vulnerable, that's why the scripture word for that orgasm is, oh, you don't know what to do, everything going crazy. You're at a point of madness. It is a point of madness. You with me? Because you can't control it. And you're at your most vulnerable point. All of you becomes open to your mate. And all of your mate becomes open to you. Depending on what God you're serving. Will have an impact in that exchange of spirit. What is supposed to happen is the same spirit supposed to be crossing the threshold. For both of you. Because there's commonality. There's this thing called yoking. But when you're yoking with somebody. Who is not of the same faith. Or when you, you are came with somebody. Who is not of any faith. In the case of young people. Because when we are going to have sex. You ain't going to ask the young lady. What religion is. <laughs> you ain't going to ask that. You ain't going to ask them. How did this worship? Who did this worship? So those people that you are having sex with. Could be demon worshippers. You don't know. Are you with me? And you are going now to have sex with them. And the sex is good. And you reach climax. And everybody come together. And the spirits exchange. You start experiencing headaches. Huh? Mood swings. You start losing concentration. Especially for godly things. And you wonder why. Wonder why. You had a nice young lady in your house. Chelsea. Wonderful young lady. Playing piano, doing music, doing everything. All of a sudden, she's not interested. All of a sudden, she has become secluded. She, she tightened her room, locked up in her corner, don't want to talk to anybody. And we don't understand why. All of a sudden, depressed. Are you with me? Wouldn't be comforted, refused to eat. Or becomes wild, becomes very, very promiscuous, changing boyfriends, changing girlfriends. Are you with me? All of these are impacting and the devil is smiling. Are you listening to me? Because we have taken something sacred. And put it to unholy use. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for them. They did a wonderful job, right? There's an exchange, chemical exchange, oxytocin, vasopressin. Oxytocin affects women. You know why it is have what you call comfort foods? You know, you know when you eat chocolate, you just get a static feeling of comfort. Huh? Well. That's because chocolate generates that oxytocin and, and you sort of feel, ah. Sex does that too. In a woman, generates oxytocin. So when she is having sex or when she has climax, she wants to cuddle. Because all of these things have been secreted. She wants to hold him. He gets vasopressin. He wants to... Boyfriend wants to go to sleep. Are you with me? Boyfriend wants to just roll over and go to sleep. If God not in a relationship, how is that going to work out? Because no woman, women, women want relationship. Men are more tending to companionship. So woman wants that, that deepening. Especially after she gives her body. She gives her body because she has worked out her love issues. She has no issues with you. She, she trusts you. She's confident. And so she will give her body because she, she believes when she gives her body, the relationship will deepen. He, on the other hand, is saying, show me love by sex. You know? But he is not deeply committed yet, depending on how things go most of the time. Not all of the time. Most of the time. Depending on how things go, he deepens after. He wants companionship. That is why people have to share lives to share body. That is why people have to share gods 
So the God is the same and they have the same philosophy and a man is submitting himself so that God will give him that tenderness and that compassion so that after he's had sex with his wife, he too now wants to cuddle because of a movement of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you what happened. I have, a, we, we used to do a program on the radio called Grace Ministries Foundation, and we used to deal with these issues. And the main man who used to talk to that program was a counselor named Pastor Philip Reed. And I asked Pastor Reed a question that I experienced when I was out in the world. You just have sex with someone, and as the sex is done, it comes like you hate the person. Do you know that's in the Bible? Did you see that with, with um, Timon and um, yeah. Tamar and Amnon? Huh? After he had sex, after he got what he wanted, he hated that. Get out! Get out! That happens. More often than not, especially in a case of unmarried people. The man ain't going to tell you nothing. Because if he tell you, get out, he ain't getting no more. You with me? So he might keep his mouth shut, but a lot of times that happens as you finish, you hate that person that you lay with. And if God is not in you controlling and, and, and you're, not, you're not having sex in the right context, these are the destructive things that happen. Are we together still? Let me take you a little further. So, situation and vast oppression, right? Sexual reality is bound because nakedness, identity, and defense. Nakedness exposes people's vulnerability. Both vulnerable parts of the body, the genitals, and the vulnerable self deprived of its artificial ego. I tell you, we put on clothes. Clothes helps us to shield and hide. Clothes protect us, by the way. I'm talking about the physical now, right? So there's dust, there's all kinds of things on these seats. Your clothes help you to keep that off. So that when clothes go, clothes has to go in a context of trust. Because not only am I exposing my vulnerable self to you, I am inviting you in to see me for who I am. That is why Sex could never just be the point of penetration. From the time the clothes starts to go and you have intention, sex has begun. Because you are communicating. Huh? You are stimulating because that's another reason why clothes go. Because we want to stimulate each other by sight. And once you're stimulating it, because you have intention to carry out an act. So you have already begun to have sex. When your clothes come off. And when you cross the barrier now and you move towards each other and you begin to touch. Huh? Sex has started long time. Are you with me? Coitus or penetration or insertion is the climax. Is when we are moving to the climactic part. But a lot of stimulation and things is going on in petting and in caressing. Am I talking the truth? In kissing, a lot of stimulation is going on. And what we are actually doing is stimulating one another to bring us to a point of climax. But sex started long time. So you have people, because they are not penetrating, they say they're not having sex. So you have young people who are feeling up one another. Well, it's a word here, feel up. Yeah, feeling up one another. And thinking we're not having no sex. This part is sensitive. You have young people who are engaging in anal sex and saying that they're keeping the virginity. The Bible says, God honored you with a body. You should honor him with all of you. You know, in, in Scripture, to be a priest and to have access to a temple, you had to be consecrated for seven days. So every priest who had to get access to the temple was at seven days. Yeah. He had to go aside for seven days. Was a seven days priest. If he's not seven days, 
he doesn't have access to temple. And every young woman in this room should be mindful of that. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. No vagabond. No person who, who desecrates Christ, who walks away from him, who refuses to submit to Christ, should have access to your body. Not a man. I don't care if he's in the Adventist church or not. The thing is, not whether he's in the Adventist church so much as is he consecrated to Christ. A man who has access to your body, sister and him, junior, has to be a priest. Priests were consecrated by the high priest applying blood to the air. The right tip of the air. Indicating all that the Lord say, I will hear. I will listen to this Lord. His right thumb was dipped in blood. All that the Lord says to do, I will do. His right big toe was dipped in blood. Anywhere the Lord sends. So he's consecrated. And then he could function in the temple if he has to have access to you. He has to be consecrated. I was telling you in the last presentation. God knows this romance thing like we, we know romance. Romantic love for God is when two people who are trying to serve him are brought together under his auspices. And because they love service, they are willing to lay down their life. God likes that. God admires that. That is God's romanticism. You see this thing where you see a man? And your eye get chunky. And you start to lose your breath. And you can't eat the food. What you have is the flu. <laughs> you hear me? You need, you, need to go, you need to go by a nurse. Go by a doctor. Get a little temperature. Check, take some medicine. And go and lie down in your bed. Talking about your falling in love. You can't. Crazy. Love is not like that. Real love. It's nothing like that. Real love is intelligent. See, the Holy Ghost comes in and tells you that is God's choice for you. He might look like what you expect. Are you listening to me? But when you go and choose the chiseled fist feature, the six pack, are you with me? The face and the expression and the way he talks. You understand? And you know, let me tell you something about women. Eh? And God made it so. Women are susceptible to talk. I don't care who you are in this room tonight. It's just a matter of time before the right man comes. And so, no, because I've seen it. I've heard women. Listen, they viciously robust and they, 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 they listen, militant. Me and them man and them, let them come. Uh -huh. <laughs> All kind of men come to flick them away. Flick them away like flies, brother Patrick. Until a certain man comes, a certain from the time he land, they turn stupid. <laughs> and gone. No, I see plenty of them. I even married some of them. Let, let me tell you about one situation where I married a young lady. And I regretted it after. No, I did, I did, I did. I tell you the truth. I regretted it. I went by a good ministerial friend and I confided in him. I said, but I married two people. And I didn't feel like I tried right this time. So he had to tell me that he did that too and he, he went to God and God forgave him. I had to go. Sweet young lady. Came from an upstanding family. You have a big name. I'm going to call you name because I know all the trainers are then afraid of it. Big name family in Adventism. Sweet, I tell you, innocent girl. 19 years. She made an appointment. She come see me. She came. She wants to get married on this date. I tell her, I don't like people to come to me with dates. Because when you come to me with dates, you don't box me in. You don't decide you're going together. If I come to you and see that you ain't going to marry me, marry then you. Yeah. I tell you, plain. So don't come with no date. When we going along the thing, we go see what date. So they agreed to bring the boyfriend. She agreed to bring the boyfriend. First thing, when she reached for the appointment, he didn't come. He was late. Back. <laughs> that is number one. That is number one. <laughs> Boyfriend then started to work himself out of my book already. 
I read you come late on the first appointment to meet the minister. Uh -uh. He ain't riding too good. The next thing you know, he come in. When I see the man, I shop. Gold teeth. Pants down. It hot sun. He have about four pants. About three jacket and some kind of thing underneath. He looking real tough. For this dainty, sweet young lady. Back. When boyfriend, when boyfriend started to talk, as he opened him out, back, back. <laughs> it finished. Pastor, I'm ready to tell the young lady, no way. No way. I say, but I order me to listen, boy, and I, I listen. Let me tell you what makes me marry these people. Because he's talking about, he has businesses all over the place, he ran up and down, and he chewing some kind of thing. I don't turn off early, but I listen to the young lady. So after a while, I put him out of the room and I, I spoke to her. Lord, she said, Pastor, I love him. I love him. I love him. She told me that. And let me tell you, my heart, Sister Ruth, went out. I believed the girl. And foolish me. Agreed. Regretted it. Two happened. <laughs> Our next young lady found this fella. When I asked them how they meet, how they met, Joy <laughs> Pastor, you know, I was missing a gunshot wound. <laughs> Back, 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 back. Yo. Boyfriend, out. That alarm went off. Back. Out. Out. But yeah, same thing, you know. Crying. 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 It didn't last three months. I was going to church that morning. Phone ring. Pastor Morris, he put me out. He tell me I'm fat and stupid. But I tell you the truth. These young people were having sex. And they became blinded. Sex supposed to blind you. Because you already decided the life issues. You already work that out. You already take the vows. You already decided to stay. So you can get blind now. But when you're blinded before you decided, listen, sex sweet, you know. Fully my people say, man. God, why ain't you no witness up in here at all? We love us. Amen. Amen. Touch your boy. Sex sweet. It's addictive. It's supposed to be so for a husband and a wife. So when you go and you do the same thing outside the context of my, the addictiveness comes to you. The addictiveness comes to you. You find yourself going over and over. And the thing about it is, somehow, if you don't have the Holy Spirit guiding you, you can't control your urges. And sometimes that urge gets so strong. I know I'm telling you. Strong. You can taste it in your mouth. You have to get some tonight. You ain't care where you get it. No, that happens. How do you think people end up in these kind of, these kind of um, what they call promiscuous situations? Multiple partners. It's an insatiable appetite. That comes over you. And there's no marriage to hold that down. There's no Holy Ghost. For me, a major disadvantage, let me tell you a major advantage of having sex in marriage. You could kneel long and say grace before meals. Am I talking to you? Yeah. Before you have sex, you can sit down and talk to the Holy Ghost. You could. 
You look at me as I talk and say, you could. When you're having sex with some boy somewhere, you can't do that. You ain't calling on God to help you with nothing because you're going against shame, eh? fear. You have the backings of heaven when you do the thing right. Let me bring you down to the end in a little bit. So the bonding on these levels, this is how many areas you're bonding. Spiritually, physically, socially, emotionally, and biologically. You bond, you're glued together. Sis, get ready with the tape. You have it? Some specific biblical realities. Come and do something. I need you. And uh, pardon any black jeans there. Yeah, you're looking around. Come, yes, you. So I wanted to take out a length of that and put it. What is length? Let me see. Let me handle this one. I think I'll do it. Put on his. Sit down there a little while. Sit down, sit down. You can put on your hand. Put on his. While I talk, right? So while she is setting them up. Sex is a spiritual phenomenon. Come on, agree or disagree? Spiritual phenomenon. It involves the joining of two temples in dedication to what? Come on, in dedication to what? The same God. Are you with me? Sex is therefore an act of? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, you ain't get that in the quarter, yeah? When they write the next one, they go put in that. Sex is an act of worship. You are paying homage to God when you do it. You're paying. That is what you're supposed to be doing. Right? Since so you're taking long to tape him up. Now, I want to show you this. I'll show you this after this is finished. This I wanted to pull it tight, don't spare him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tight. Sit on that side. Yeah. Sit on that side. Right. Triangular model of marriage. What is supposed to happen? God is at the center of the marriage. Are you with me? You have the husband and you have the wife. And if both of them are moving towards God, what is going to happen to them? They get closer to one another. Are you with me? That is the triangular model. And that is how it is. And I want you to see that this model emulates another model. You see that? Husband, the wife, and God in a triangular relationship is an image of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a triangular relationship. You got that? So that when the husband, the wife, and God come together, Paying homage to God, it is an act of worship. Sacred. When you go pick up some girl and come together, it's the devil on the top there. You know? I should have put in that one. You with me? No, no God in it. No, no God in it. And what is even more? If the husband should take somebody else, you no longer have that angular mode. Yeah? Different kind of image. It's not the image of God. That's why God says he hates adultery. Are you with me? Because adultery cannot testify of him at all. It is an image of another God. Are you with me? So we are supposed to, that coming together and joining of bodies is supposed to reflect God. All extramarital sex is wrong in itself. Simply because the body is not meant for sexual immorality. And he who sins sexually sins against his own body. You got that? You remember in the beginning we say how, how God honored you with a body? So God didn't give you an honorable body to be used for dishonorable things. Are we together? Didn't do that. Didn't do that. In other words, or sex between two unmarried people is a subhuman act. Because sexual intercourse is a unique kind of body language which the creator has designed to express and seal that special, exclusive, lifelong relationship between a man and a woman, which the Bible labels marriage. 
God made it as a kind of body language to be expressed by people who have agreed that they're sharing their lives together. When it is used outside of that, it becomes subhuman, less than human behavior. You see how dogs are? Have you ever noticed dogs? Dogs are caught. Male dog walk up, female dog, she's in heat, he's getting the scent. He's going to jump on, do his thing, and go his way. When we commit extramarital sex and affairs, premarital, we operate the same way. I don't care if she gave consent or if he gave consent. It is the same thing. Your body was made for an honorable process. And when you, when you use it outside of God's ordained thing, you slap him in the face. Are we together still? Consequently, because sexual intercourse ties people to the divine, ties you to the divine. Remember, we just show the husband, the wife, and God, when they have sex, they are bound up together with God in a union, in a relationship. Its power is highly valued and considered the greatest power that humans possess. In scripture, a person is, just, is not just a body that can be detached from the totality of his or her being to function simply as an object of pleasure by another for personal sexual satisfaction. What they're saying is, if God has designed you to be a vessel of honor, you can't just detach yourself and use yourself for anything that you want. Somebody else can't just take you and use you just so. Since one's personal values cannot be separated from one's body, a dehumanization of the body has a direct impact on our self-image, leaving behind permanent scars in the school. Ask people who have messed up sexually how painful that is. How it, 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 it messes up in plenty. I, I had a good friend, my wife and I, before she was born, we were, we were in the same church together. And we had a good friend. I used to feel so sorry, Pastor. She couldn't help herself. Couldn't. She has been sexual with anybody and everybody. They even disfellowshipped her, but that didn't work. That didn't work. You understand? And when you really got down to the heart of it, she was molested as a young girl. That sexual thing mashed up her whole life. And you have many people sitting down in congregations going through the same pain. People who would have made mistakes and given themselves to men and to women. And they promised that it would be more but nothing ever happened. It got worse. And now they're walking around with all this baggage. Jesus heals any wounded heart. I assure you of that. Sex without love and permanent commitment bypasses personhood and drags the individual to a lower state of status of existence. Sex without love and permanent commitment. So if you are having sex, there's no love, there's no permanent commitment. It is saying it bypasses personhood and drags the individual to a lower status of existence. It is only in mutual trust and love that we surrender ourselves to another person. Amen? Amen. In mutual trust and love. Physical pleasure, separated from soul commitment in love, even if enjoyed, splits that which God United. Come and help me, please. You take him. And they'll hold out your hands. This is what sex is. Binding activity. Huh? And that, I want you to do what I do, is supposed to last 
forever. But when individuals, when young people, even married people, go and have sex once and you're all about, the bonding and the binding takes place. But then because there's no love and no commitment, right? You have to pull it off in that kind of way. It causes a measure of discomfort, doesn't it? Of course it does. Of course it does. Because that separation was never meant to happen. Never meant. This is supposed to be getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. I'm sure if this tape was stronger, thank you, sit down. I'm sure if the tape was stronger, you'd have seen here follicles in it. Huh? Because when they pull us, pull it apart, it would have taken a piece of them. Yes. Yes. So every time we have sex in an environment of no commitment, and we go away and we change partners, peace of us is taken. Anybody does accounts here, accounting, finance, anybody into finance? You know there's something called depreciation. If a company buys a car, pays 60,000 pounds, they will say this car has a five-year life. Every year, it goes down by 12,000 pounds till it comes to zero. That is called the diminishing, diminishing balance method. Satan is doing accounts with your life. He wants to get you involved in sexual activity quick. So the faster you get in, the faster you depreciate. And he will let all kinds of situations come your way till you reach the place where you feel like zero. Where you feel like zero. I want to touch one more thing and then I want to make an altar call and pray. Remember the story of Onan? scripture and you remember onanism onan onan's brother died and he was supposed to take his brother place in terms of having children with his brother's wife god allowed that he had sex with the woman and he spilled seed on the ground watch this you see that thing called seed? That seminal fluid that contains those 300 to 500 million sperm? Sacred! Sacred! To waste that, God takes a seriously dim view. So for the men, masturbation, that may give you physical pleasure, but allows you to spill seed. Seriously wrong. Seriously wrong. That is not something to waste, Brother Moses. When you go and have premarital sex, chances are you don't want children. You may use a condom or you may decide to withdraw in time. Nevertheless, seed is spilt. It's a serious issue with Almighty God. Are you with me? Masturbation in any form is wrong. You're giving pleasure to yourself. When you ejaculate, who calls you to ejaculate? You! So who you had sex with? You! That is not right in the sight of God at all. Seed is very, very important. Very, very, very critical. So a man cannot be going as Ellen White said, sowing wild oats all about the place. That is to be used in a context of a considered thought to bring life and to add to the kingdom of God. Tonight, 
Some of us may have made mistakes. I've made many. And I've confessed them all before Jesus. And I am confident to us that he wiped away every one of those things. Even if you're a woman, I could bring people here to testify how God made them like new. Huh? They would have given themselves up, given themselves away, done many things, and God made them like new. I have seen women who have lived profligate lives. God blessed them with outstanding husbands. I've seen it. I've seen it. And so if people have made mistakes in this room, that same God can be your shepherd and friend starting tonight. If it is that right now you are involved in premarital sexual activity, God wants you to stop that. He will make his power available. If you would confess and ask him, ask him to forgive you, ask him to, to give you a new start. If you are having an affair, you are bringing shame to God. You are erecting a structure, an image to the devil. No question about that. God wants you to walk out from that relationship. Go back home to the wife of your youth, to the husband of your youth. I want to make this space tonight a space for forgiveness and restoration. This space. When you come in this box here, forgiveness and restoration tonight. Play for us. You singing? All to Jesus. Give me that. All to Jesus. I surrender. We listen to the first stanza. And if you want to say, Lord, I want to give myself away. Give you this body of mine. So you could use me. Then after the singing of the first stanza, I want you to leave where you are. Come into this box of forgiveness and restoration. Sing the first stanza, okay. please. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else is coming tonight. God bless you. Somebody else is coming for healing, for restoration, for forgiveness, to consecrate their vessels to Almighty God. God bless you. Come forward. Come forward. Somebody else is coming. Somebody else is coming tonight. So sing the second stanza for us. 
Won't you come now? God bless you, sis. Somebody else is coming tonight. You are coming to devote your temple to God so that he can use it for holy purposes. Come now. Mm. God bless you. 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 Pull them in, Pastor. Pull them in. Pull them in. Pull them in. God bless you. God bless you, sis. God bless you, young man. God bless you, sis. God bless you, young man. Ah, yes. God bless you, sir. Somebody tonight is saying, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Won't you be a sanctuary for Jesus tonight? If you are willing, come now. Come now. Let's get the next sentences. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Mm. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else is coming. Young people, young people need to come and give this body back to Jesus so that he can fulfill within you what he has always had in his mind. Won't you come now? Young people, come now. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Come now. Pull them in, Pastor. Pull them in. We have room. We have room. We have room. We have room. There's still room here for individuals willing to be instruments in the hand of God. You want God to guide you, to direct you so that when the issue of sex comes before you, you can work it out. You can depend and you are willing to depend on him to show you who, when, why. Somebody wants to say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Sis, last answer, and we go. I'm not going to say too long tonight, the message has been clear. If you're coming, come now. God bless you. God bless you. Come in. Yes. heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, we want to thank you for the compassion and mercy of your son Jesus. 
we want to thank you for making this little box the place of forgiveness and restoration tonight. The place of empowerment. We pray for every person who has come into this box tonight. Not afraid to confess that they have need of you, God. Father, some of them may have made mistakes just like the preacher. Some of them want to cast themselves at your feet so that you can forgive them and you can restore them. Father, if you have forgiven me, God, you can forgive anybody in this room. And Lord, I pray that your forgiveness will be poured out. Your restoration would be great. Your empowerment would be significant in the life of the person who has come down to this altar. May you forgive them. May you bless them. May you restore them. May you give them that power, Father, that they could stand fast and withstand the temptations of the evil one, especially sexual temptation. I pray, God, that in this church, that they will continue to educate the members and continue to guide and direct them and provide support for them, Father, so that they can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I pray that you will bind every person that has come to this altar. Speak to their hearts personally, Lord. Take them by the hand and lead them in your cycles of righteousness and understanding. And I pray that they will find every day with Jesus sweeter than the day before. They will find that they have victory over sin, Father. And the more victory they have, the more they will submit to you so that they can continue to be victorious. I pray your blessing upon this congregation as we leave this place now. Let the words of our mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Help us to remember all that was said tonight, Lord. And help us to give ourselves away every single day so that you can use us. May your blessings be upon us now and forevermore, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, neighbors. See you on tomorrow evening. God bless you.